between the lines Welcome to another edition of What's Going On. I'm your host, Tom D'Ambra. As always, we are very thankful you take the time from your busy day to join us. Uh, we hope in the last three broadcasts that we've had that you enjoyed the program. Um, I wanted to show that to everybody because it really ties in very well. Um, not only the events of today, but it ties them into yesteryear, if you would. It, the, the secret societies that are still prevalent today um, that a lot of people think do not exist. If, if you watch this documentary, it gave you the understanding that there is a course of individuals, elite individuals, um, that do have secret societies working below their thumb, if you would, you know, doing all their work that they wish to do. Um, and it's through deception and manipulation um, and through our ignorance and apathy that they're able to fulfill their goal of bringing us into a new world order. Um, I just wanted to show that documentary because I thought another thing it did very well was demonstrate to you how you are a surety for the insolvent corporation that you know is the United States government. So I had been promising you for the last four weeks that we were going to, to uh, teach you eventually how to actually look up the bond that you are bonded through with your birth certificate. So what I did, folks, and I know uh, the good folks here at the studio can get this on, on the uh, screen for you. Uh, but I want you to see this, and we're going we're gonna to bring this up on the screen so you can read it verbatim. But this is a copy of my birth certificate, and we're going to break the language down. But if you look at the very bottom, down here on the left, in the very, very uh, small print, you will see Midwest Bank Note Company. And you have to be, it's very small print. Now, let me just back up here. You have to go to the Office of Vital Statistics and request the original certificate. Now, do you remember that, uh, some years ago we, uh, on this broadcast, we went over the, all the language on this, and we're going to do a little bit of that again. Uh, for sake of time, we can't go over as thoroughly as we did um, some years ago because we are, we, I'm going to teach you the mechanics literally of getting on the internet um, and using a brokerage firm to look up the bond and see how much it's worth. Uh, you're going to be shocked, folks. Um, a lot of people do not understand this, but we are a surety. And what I mean by a surety, and we can, let's look that word up real quick if we could, but basically um, what a surety is, is that basically they have created an artificial person, and we're going to get into that in a little bit of depth, but when, you, when your mother, who was the only one who could basically uh, negotiate contract for you because you were not old enough to negotiate contract, you have to be 18 and or 21 years old, uh, depending on what state you're in, your mother signed a birth certificate. Of course, she didn't read this. Because if she had read this, you know, she's in the hospital, she wants to get out of the hospital. Some administrator walks up to her with a series of papers, sign here, sign here, sign here, sign here, which would have taken hours upon hours to read. Um, but it is a binding document. Your, your mother signed it. She created the artificial entity known in law as a norm de guerre. And this is why I have said to you in previous shows that... If you wish to uh, understand this and demonstrate it for yourself, take out your driver's license. And I care not what state you're from, but you will see that your name is in uppercase black ink. And there's a reason for that. It's because you are, this is an a artificial entity, all right? And basically, if, if you take any of the um, instruments that are written to you from the government, you'll see it's uppercase black ink. If you go to the post office and look at the selective service um, uh, registration form, if you would, you will see it says right on it, and we brought this in some time ago and read it to you verbatim and, sh and showed this to you, uppercase black ink only. Now, why is this? They don't have computers that can read in pencil or in small uh, uh, upper and lower case? No, it's because they are contracting with you through commercial law, all right? But let's, let's get back a little bit there's a couple of quotes I want to read, and then we're going to get into actually what, a, what is a surety, all right? Here's a quote 
from uh, James Madison, and this goes back some centuries ago. Folks, nothing has changed. It's all the same under the sun. It's the same battle being waged, only today they have more technology. They control the education system. They control the media. They control the issuance of our currency. And what was it Baron Rothschild said? Give me control of a nation's currency. I care not who makes its laws. That's because he's controlling it all. Okay? You know, we had this big facade recently about whether the United States government, the insolvent corporation, was going to raise the debt ceiling. And I said to you, folks, that, that's the dog and pony show for you to watch. Oh, they have to do something. We have to raise the debt ceiling. Well, a couple of things. Number one, they never got down to the reasonings why we're in debt. And the reason why we're in debt, folks, is because a private foreign bank that you know is the Federal Reserve banking system controls the issuance of our currency. And for every dollar, which is not a dollar, and, and you know what? And while we're speaking of what a dollar is and what a dollar is not, let's go to uh, Black's Law Dictionary, fourth edition, and let's look up the definition of money. Money, in usual and ordinary acceptance, it means gold, silver, or paper money used as a circulating medium of exchange, but does not embrace notes, bonds, or evidence of debt. Very, very interesting, because folks, what do we have for a medium of exchange? The Federal Reserve Note. And if you remember, we looked up the word note on many a show, and we've come to the understanding and the conclusion that a note is an obligation of debt. I remember my mother speaking as a child that, oh, we have to be careful this week because we have to pay the note for this month. Well, the, no the note she was speaking of was the mortgage. And we broke this word down, and it's a French word, mortgage, death pledge. So basically what they're doing with this mortgage is they're keeping you in debt until death, death pledge, okay? So understand we do not have money. Now let's get into the reasons what happened to our money. The United States of America did have the most sought-after currency in the entire world. It was backed by gold and silver. Do you remember some shows years ago, we took out all the different coinage acts and we read them verbatim to you, and we came to the understanding that a true dollar, a real dollar, not this Federal Reserve note that we have today, because we do not have dollars, a true dollar was uh, 25.8 grams of gold and a 15 to 1 ratio of silver. So it's very interesting that today we've, we, we went from this intrinsic certificate of money where it was backed by intrinsic value with that gold and or silver and now we've now we find ourselves at the bequest of foreign bankers who control our money system or lack of because of the fact that the corporation that you know as the United States government went insolvent to these folks on March 9th 1933 and all they did folks was put in the Federal Reserve Act in December of 1913 while the Congress was away for the Christmas holidays. They never adjourned the original session. And then when all the congressmen and congresswomen went home for the Christmas holidays, they snuck in this act and, and President Wilson signed it into play on, on the 23rd of December. The Congress came, home, uh, came back in session uh, back in late January and discovered unbelievably so, that the biggest usury in the history of the uh, American Republic had taken place. And so from, it took them from 1913 until 1929, just 16 years, to destroy the American money system that is, was so prevalent and so sought after by the world. Just 16 years because they had control of the issuance of the currency. Really amazing fact. So what happened with the bankruptcy folks is the insolvent corporation, again you know is the government, goes bankrupt. And we're going to break some of the language down, but right now I'm going to give you a, a, a quick overlay of it, if you would. So this corporation goes bankrupt to another corporation, the Federal Reserve. The United States government, remember, do you remember we broke down in Black's Law Dictionary, we looked up the United States of America, USA, US, and all that, and what did we discover? 
we discovered that the definition of the United States of America and or USA actually has three definitions. And we read this verbatim to you. But let's just review this real quick. One of the, one of the definitions was the states that make up the Union. The other was the territory that makes up the United States. And the third definition of United States was what? A corporation. And we also read to you verbatim the Organic Act of 1871 when the United States became a corporation. And folks, that's basically what the Civil War was all about. The Civil War on both sides of, of the playing field was financed by the Rothschild family. Uh, James Rothschild operating out of Paris financed the South and another Rothschild operating out of England the uh, banking house of Rothschild financed the North and if you remember Abraham Lincoln's famous quote about um, I ha this is when the, the Confederate Army was knocking on the door of Washington DC he said I have I have the Confederate Army in my front yard and I have the the international banksters as he called them in my backyard and for the future of my nation it is the bankers I fear the most. And this is exactly that history so long ago is, is what's playing out here today. The Federal Reserve uh, bill was a hundred year term. This bill terminates itself uh, on December 22nd of 2013. Now if the American people understood this, of course you're not hearing about this in the media, but to me, this is probably the last chance that the American people have to not only gain control of their money system by terminating this contract, not renewing it, but also of their lives and of their children's lives. I mean, think of this, folks. The IRS is a for-profit corporation. We read that verbatim to you from Dun & Bradstreet. We read to you four different uh, entities of law um, four shows ago, demonstrating that even in law and in the congressional record, the IRS is an agency, a franchise agency of the Federal Reserve Banking System. So the agency that is bleeding our country, bleeding our people, and just the working people, the blue-collared people, because as we read to you uh, four weeks ago, companies like General Electric, who own NBC and so forth, they have not paid income taxes in well over three years, legally. Think of that. Your, your money is taken out of your paycheck before you even see it. And we read to you verbatim the Grace Commission, where the Grace Commission discovered that, wow, none of the money that goes from the income tax goes into the operations of the government. And I know you're thinking, well, how do they pave the roads, Tom? That can't be. Well, here's how they pave the roads, folks. You buy a gallon of gasoline, you buy a tire, you buy a spark plug, you buy a quart of oil, you have work done on your car, you register your car. There are taxes, road usage taxes, that are applied to that gallon of gasoline, that tire, that spark plug, whatever it may be. That goes into the operations for the roads. This government, before 1933, folks, had no taxes levied directly upon the people. They didn't have the right to. And what I mean by that is, the, the, it's, it's hard for Americans to understand, but folks, prior to the Civil War, you didn't really care who the President of the United States was. And here's the reason why. They were only, the federal government could only be involved in enclaves, territories, and districts, as in the District of Washington, D.C. District of Criminals, as I call it. So they didn't have any uh, means of encroachment into the business of the states. Of course, that all changed. They flip-flopped the inferior and superior positioning by the Organic Act of 1871 and through emergency powers uh, that were delegated by Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War. If you want to read a very interesting book, folks, and it will shock you, but it's all facts, read the book, The Real Lincoln. And you will find out that Abraham Lincoln, during the Civil War, if your newspaper did not publish favorable printings to what he was trying to implement, 
He threw editors in jail through military tribunals, literally. He was the first person to conscript different people, uh, ab able-bodied men. He conscripted. He was the first one. He, they say that Lincoln saved the Union. Well, history tells us a whole different story. Lincoln did not save the Union, although Lincoln became aware that when the international bankers were charging him a 24% interest, Lincoln decided that this could not be, this was not going to be, and he issued greenbacks based on the faith of the United States government itself. The bankers were not happy with that. The, my famous quote that I love to use from Napoleon Bonaparte is that history is agreed upon lies by the victors is absolutely true. Bonaparte was financed through the Rothschild Banking House, particularly James D. Rothschild out of Paris, France. But what happened was he got a little too smart for his own britches, if you would, because he, started, he did the same thing that Lincoln would later on do. And he issued his own money through the faith of the French government at the time. The bankers were losing control. They wound up putting him on an island. And I forget the name of the island right now, but that's what happened. That's, that's why this man went from Emperor of France and, and, and a worldwide known name to a recluse on an island, and I believe it was off of France itself. And that's the reason why, because the bankers were about to lose control. They couldn't have that. So it's the same thing with JFK, who I believe is the last true president for the people that we've had in this country. And I hope you've got to listen to the words, to the speech of JFK in 1961 when he was speaking to the National Press Club, asking them for their assistance in exposing this monolithic worldwide conspiracy. He asked the, the, the press of the country to help him expose this. And if, if you didn't see the documentary, I ask you to go on the internet and punch in um, JFK's speech to the National Press Club 1961 on secret societies, and it is fantastic. This man understood what was going on. And then with Executive Order 11110, he went forward and he started issuing certificates based on silver. He realized there was no gold at Fort Knox, and there was a figure of somewhere in the area of $2.68 trillion worth of silver. So he started issuing silver certificates. And you can still go to like pawn shops and, and coin shops and so forth, and you can find these for sale. Of course, you can't go to the bank and get your ounce of silver anymore. But you can uh, see and, and, and look at the writing on it and see that this was an intrinsic valued uh, medium of exchange and the bankers were losing control and being exposed. We know, all know what took place um, in November of 1963 with John F. Kennedy. Okay, a couple of quick quotes here. This is from James Madison. History records that the money changers have used every form of abuse, intrigue, deceit, and violent means possible to maintain their control over governments by controlling money and its issuance. Very interesting. Again, it all comes down to who controls the issuance of the currency. All right. I, uh, just a couple more here. <clears throat> this is from John F. Halen. You may have not have heard of him before, but he was a very famous mayor um, of New York City, actually, uh, from 1918 to 1925. And this is him speaking quite openly. And this is 1925, folks. The real menace of our republic is the invincible government, which, like a giant octopus, sprawls its slimy legs over our cities, states, and our nation. At the head is a small group of banking houses. This little corte runs our government for their own selfish ends. It operates under cover of a self-created screen seizes our executive officers, our legislative bodies, our schools, our courts, our newspapers, and every agency created for the public protection. That is just an incredible statement. 
incredible statement. It operates under a cover of a self-created screen, seizes our executive offices, our legislative bodies, our schools, our courts, newspapers, and every agency created for the public protection. This is another quote from Senator Barry Goldwater. Um, Senator Barry Goldwater was a senator from Arizona back in the 50s and 60s, uh, and he tried to warn the American people as to what was going on. This is a great quote from him. I believe that if the people of this nation fully understood what Congress has done to them over the last 49 years, they would move on Washington. They would not wait for an election. It adds up to a preconceived plan to destroy the economic and social independence and man manipulation the credit of the United States. So again, what he's talking about is how they're controlling this and they're doing this with the control of the issuance of our currency and if we go to Article 1, Section 8, and I believe it's Clause 10 of the United States Constitution, we will see that the Congress of the United States has the duties and the responsibilities and obligation to control the issuance of the currency and that it would be based on intrinsic value of gold and silver species only. And as I just read to you, because we use Federal Reserve notes, we do not even have money. We have legal tender. So what happened to our money? What happened to the gold and silver? You know, as a child, I remember the elderly of, of my time as a child, uh, you know, what we call change now. They used to call it silver. All their coins that was in silver back when they were a child. And they would call it silver. Oh, I got I to, gotta, let me reach into my silver and see if I have a dime. Let me reach into my silver and see if I have a quarter for you. We don't have that anymore. No more. So what happened to it? Okay. Now, what happens to it is, as we started to discuss, one corporation seizes the other corporation. The United States of America, the corporation, goes bankrupt to another corporation known as the Federal Reserve Banking System. So they seize all the gold and silver. They lean the public trust. And the public trust was set up by Teddy Roosevelt. Basically, Teddy Roosevelt was the first president to take a look around and say, hey, you know what? We are expanding. We're building. We're building. We're building as a nation. Let's protect and preserve some of our natural lands. So he created a public trust so it would be left to the people of this country. Well, the insolvent corporation offered it as collateral. So all the gold and silver was taken, the public trust was leaned, and then in March 9th, 1933, it came to the understanding that, gee, this corporation that you know is the United States government does not have any more credit to keep the ship afloat. And this is what I'm talking about when I said the whole thing was a dog and pony show about raising the, the debt level, because folks, the insolvent corporation has no power to the solvent corporation. If you were the president of a corporation, and it just happened to be named the United States of America, and it has been insolvent since March 9th, 1933, folks, who are you going to be answering to as the president of that corporation? Are you going to be answering to the shareholders slash voters? Or do you have to answer to the creditors slash bankers that are keeping your insolvent ship afloat. It's very simple. You have to answer to the creditors. So when you wonder why these crazy acts like CAFTR and GATT and NAFTA and all these things that we finance our own demise to send our manufacturing base overseas, how that takes place besides the under the table dirty credits and, and uh, corruption that's going on at the federal level, Besides all that, besides the direct payoffs and the offshore accounts and all this, the main reason is because they, the insolvent corporation is answering to its creditors. And its creditors are telling the insolvent corporation what to do. Do you remember that quote 
when uh, the CFR opened up an, a satellite office in Washington, D.C., down the road from the State Department, and Hillary Clinton on public television said that, oh, we're very, very glad that the CFR has opened up a satellite office here in Washington because now we won't have to go so far to be told what we should be doing, unquote. So who's controlling the mechanisms of what you perceive to be the government? The creditors, the bankers, the very same bankers that cut $28.3 trillion through the top funds. And now we find out that most of that money, all of that money is pretty much unaccountable for. And we find out that a lot of it went overseas to other banks. What a surprise. But folks, I want you to think about this. We talked about the interest bond that is due for every dollar that's in your pocket. Folks, now there's an interest bond due on every one of them, $28.3 trillion, because they gave us permission to print it to give to them in the first place. And now, not only are they getting the $28.3 trillion, now they're going to get the interest bond due for the rest of your life, for the rest of, the ch of your child's lives, your grandchildren. They're bonded. They are a surety to the debt. Fancy word, surety. Let's look that up and see what a surety is. Surety, a person who is primarily liable for the payment of another's debts or the performance of another's obligation. You're a surety. You are liable for the payment of another's debts. Or you are for the, uh, reliable for the performance of another, another's obligation. It's really both. Because you're paying an interest due to creditors of an insolvent corporation, and you're laboring every day to fulfill another's obligation. Now, you may say to yourself, how is it, Tom, that I became liable for this, this debt, this obligation, which was done completely through fraud, by the way. And we've got into the mechanics of it many a uh, show ago. Uh, unfortunately, again, for time's sake, I can't go through the whole thing. But basically, you have the understanding that for every so-called dollar, which is not a dollar, is in your pocket, there is an interest bond due on that because they gave us permission to print it, to use it as a medium of exchange. And it's as worthless as this piece of paper. There's nothing backing it up except for your labors. But the difference between this piece of paper and the legal tender piece of paper is that you accept it for the transfer of goods and services. That is the only difference. Of course, they have you at, literally at gunpoint saying you must use this, and this is legal tender, and you will use it. Because we have had other companies that have put out intrinsic value money, uh, particularly silver, and the feds have come after them and put them in jail. Now, if you look up the definition of counterfeit, you will see that you're using a counterfeit script. There's nothing backing it up. It's a deception. There is nothing in our money system except for your labors, folks. All right? And you, as a surety, you became a surety when your mother signed an instrument known as the birth certificate. Now, let's back up a little bit because if you did some research, you would see that you do not own anything. How can you own anything? We are in a commercial law system, and in a commercial law system, you are either a debtor or a creditor. Debtors cannot maintain possession of anything. Take out your deed. You will find out that you think you own it, and if you do think you own it, go ahead and don't pay your extortion fee known as property taxes uh, for a couple of years, and you're going to find out who really owns your land. But what that goes on here, folks, is that with you being a surety, in a commercial law system, you are a debtor. You cannot own anything. So if you took out your deeds, you would see that you are listed three ways, one of three ways. You are a tenant, a tenant in common, or a joint tenant. Tenants do not maintain 
possession or ownership. If you went back further and did some more research, you would see that prior to 1933, there was a thing in this country called a loyal title. And a loyal is in Latin means absolute. You owned it. You know, and I get a kick out of, uh, there's a television station, I think it's called RTV or something along that line. Anyway, they play a lot of some of the old shows. And, and uh, a friend of mine who was a lot younger, didn't, you know, wasn't born when Bonanza was on, but he happened to notice the part where um, the, one of the Cartwrights was selling some land. And all he did was take the allodial title, the deed, out of his safe. He signed it off to him as an endorse it and gave it to him. No recording of the land, no, uh, um, you know, no obligation with attorneys. And we, knocked, we, we went over the base word of attorney to attorn to separate ones from one's property. Rather interesting. We, and so there, it was a different process then because the, insolvent, the land was not lean through the insolvency. But your land is leaned now. You cannot own it because there is a lien against it through the creditors. And when you get to the very top of that pyramid, the top of that pyramid winds up at a place called the Bank of International Settlements, and it's in Basel, Switzerland. And please go on the internet and look it up. As a matter of fact, in that last documentary that we showed, um, they, he actually got into that, into the Bank of International Settlements. So, you know, we start out down here with, with the Federal Reserve. We get to the International Monetary Fund. But when you get to the top of the pyramid, the Bank of International Settlements. So, you being a surety, you were bonded. All right? And there's a note here that I made in a surety ship, the legal relation that arises when one party assumes liability for a debt or default or other failings of a second party. That second party that is using your labors as credit is the insolvent corporation, again, that you know as the United States government. Okay. Now, so what happens here is, well, how do I not own my land? How can that be that I do not own my land? I maintain it, I pay it for it, I groom it, I give it love, I give it attention. Okay, uh, and we, to understand this, we've got to go back a little bit. We have to look up what a person is. And a person in Black Seventh, and I know we looked it up in Fourth before, but just to be quick here, uh, one of my notes came from Black Seventh, um, is a person is an entity such as a corporation having the rights and duties of a human being. So when you go into court and they, and you know, I think I told this story sometime before, the first time I went into court and I heard a woman say, I am not a person, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, what's going on here? I see a vertical, standing, walking, talking, breathing female who's telling the court that she's not a person. Well, what she's telling the court is she is not a corporate entity because in law, a person is a corporate entity. It has to be. It's the only way they can contract you through a commercial law system. But because the average person does not understand this, they go in there assuming the liability of what is known as the norm de guerre or the slang is known as the straw man. And the straw man is the link to your birth certificate bond. Mine happens to me, as we said, from the Midwest Bank Note Company. And please stay with me. I know, I know this is a little complicated, but it's really very simple, folks. We've been deceived. We've been hoodwinked, as my mother used to say. Unofficial person. This is, again, Black Seventh, an entity such as a corporation created by law and given certain legal rights and duties of a human being, a being real or imaginary who for the purpose of legal reasoning is treated more or less as a human being. Isn't that very interesting? So you go into court thinking you're representing yourself. In other words, this paper from the IRS, this paper from the court system, you are assuming is addressed to you. You are assuming that you have liabilities and, and, and 
regulations that affect you. Folks, they are contracting with the straw man, the nom de guerre, the artificial person. This is who they are delegating to. Not to the flesh and blood you. When did you contract with these folks? Folks, think of this. It's a commercial law system. We've read that to you verbatim through different acts. If it's a commercial law system, which it obviously is, where did you contract with it? Where did you sign the dotted line to make yourself liable to these, this organization's laws and statutes? There's no legislation here. Legislation is when a group of representative, representing the common people, get together, entertain bills and language of bills, and then vote on it in a yay or nay fashion. Statues are created by non-representing agencies of, of commercial entities. This is why they're old, always written in codes. When you hear the word code, understand that you are in a commercial venue of law. And if you want to go back a, a, a bit farther, we got into this at one show, we looked up the origins of the word code and discovered the Latin was from coda to be altered secretly. The language, folks, has been altered secretly. And it's been an, an, a pot of deception to make you think that you are liable for this artificial entity, this norm de guerre, this straw man that was created when your mother signed a piece of paper through the International Monetary Fund and bonded you through private corporations. Now, if you were born here in Vermont, it's more than likely that the corporation that bonded you is the North American Bank Note Company. Um, it's, it's one of two throughout the country. It's either going to be the Midwest Bank Note Company or the uh, North American Bank Note Company. And you have to look at the very small print, but it's right down here. Okay? But you have to go again to the Office of Vital Statistics to get the original documentation. And it'll also read to you um, that, you know, this is on surety, uh, uh, excuse me, security paper. Why? Because you're the surety for, for the debt. So, of course, it's on security paper. So, we see now that we are representing an artificial entity. And we also have to come to the understanding of how is it that I don't own my land? I mean, after all, the government doesn't come over here and cut my grass every week. The government doesn't come over here and shovel my driveway for me in the wintertime. How is it that they own my land? Own their land. How dare you improve that land? You don't have to pay for that. So let's go to Senate Document 43. This is the 73rd Congress first session. And um, this is just an incredible statement. Uh, you, can, you can go to the Congressional Record, and I'm going to read it verbatim to you. Again, please look this up. Senate Document 43, 73rd Congress, First Session. Here we go. The ownership of all property is in the state. Individual so-called ownership is only by virtue of government, i.e. law amounting to mere user and use must be in accordance with law and subordinate to the necessities of the state. Folks, there's where you lost your rights of ownership. Senate document 43. I want to read it one more time rather quickly. The ownership of all property is in the state individual so-called ownership is by virtue of government, i.e. law amounting to mere user, and use must be in accordance with law and subordinate to the necessities of the state. Kilo versus, oh, I forget the, the, the town, it was in Connecticut. Um, they wanted to take some land that was on, on, on waterfront, and they wanted to tear the houses down, even though these people were living in these houses. So the, the uh, owners of the ha 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 
the residents, the tenants of the house, of the houses, the properties, got together and filed a lawsuit at Bridgeport against Bridgeport, Connecticut. Kilo versus Bridgeport. Please look it up. Anyway, it went all the way to the Federal Supreme Court. And the Federal Supreme Court sided, no surprises here, with the town of Bridgeport. And the reason why is because, folks, the residents are tenants. They do not own the land. The corporation has every right to do with its property of what the corporation wishes to do. And the Supreme Court would not come out and say it so bluntly, but through their decisions, they were letting the people know that they do not own any, their land. Okay? So that's, this is how the Supreme Court came to that conclusion. Because when you really think about it, folks, the state of Connecticut is an insolvent corporation. Uh, the, the state of Connecticut is a franchise of the insolvent corporation in the United States of America. And Bridgeport, Connecticut is a franchise the, of the insolvent corporation of the United States of government through the state of Connecticut. Very interesting. So, when your mother signs this birth certificate, a bond is created. And the bond that is created, believe it or not, is traded publicly. Now, here's where you're going to need a pen and paper. I hope you're always, when you're watching this show, have a pen and paper because we read a lot of stuff like this verbatim to you. But now I want to get into, you understand your bond. You understand the mechanics of the bond. You understand the historical, very lame in terms, but the, the historical data of why you are bonded and how the straw man, the norm de guerre, is created through this bond in a commercial law system. Now, let's get to the understanding of how much your straw man bond is worth. Now, you have to bear with me. You've got to get a pen and paper, or if you're, if you're at a computer, you can, you can do this as I'm going through the mechanics of this. It's a little complicated. For those of you that have never looked up um, anything on the stock exchange, you're going to find it very complicated. So please go and get a pen and paper right now so you can have this down. You're not going to be able to do this from memory. I have looked up my own folks, and I have to have this in front of me so I can do it. Okay. I have found the easiest way to do this is to go to www.fidelity.com and you're spelling Fidelity, F-I-D-E-L-T-Y and you're going to click on research, all right, and then the screen is going to change and then after that you're going to see a section that's going to say quotes and you want to click on quotes, all right. Once you do that, it's going to be a... A, uh, a menu, if you would, of different options you're going to have, and you want to click on the one that says Find Symbol. All right, and once you get to that point, you're going to see there's going to be Search, and you're going to put, punch in Search for Mutual Fund, M U T U A L. Now, here's where it gets interesting. You're going to be at that point, and there's going to be uh, an area where they're going to want you to enter the stock exchange number. Now, with these numbers, there are usually letters in the front of them. So disregard the letters. You're just looking for the numbers here. And if you come to this red cuspis right here in the lower left, okay, you're going to punch that number in. And once that number, once you punch that number in, you're going to uh, go to the search value, and it's going to say that, search value, and then you want to click on search. And what that is going to do is you have given this uh, computer, the system, if you would, enough information that it's going to go into the public stock exchange. It's going to correlate that number. All right? Now, once you get, once it does that, Below the search, you're going to see a hyperlink. It'll, it'll appear, and it'll say um, Fidelity Select Leisure. And sometimes, folks, it comes up as capital F-D-L-S-X. All right? That's how it usually does come up, I, I, the capital F-D-L-S-X. Anyway, click on that hyperlink. All right? And then, believe it or not, it takes a little bit of time, 
but your mutual fund will appear once you click on the hyperlink research. And your dollar information is going to appear. And if you want to really be shocked, the name of the fund manager will also appear. Folks, your labors through this bond are used as a surety for the insolvent corporation that you know as the federal, I mean, as the United States government to the creditor of the Federal Reserve Banking System. Think of that. Now, I know there was, there was a lot here, and I'm just going to review it real quick, okay? Again, www.fidelity.com. Click on Research. Then that, that screen will change. Then you're going to click on Quotes, um, and you're going to find uh, the symbol um, for mutual funds. So you're going to click on that symbol, and then you're going to go back to your red cuspis numbers. You're going to type them in on that search engine. Um, and then there's a hyperlink that's going to appear, and you're going to go to FDLSX, and what that stands for is Fidelity Select Leisure. Click on that hyperlink, all right, and then your mutual fund will appear with the dollar value and the name of the current manager of the fund. I, I, I know there's a lot there. If you're a computer savvy, you're saying, oh, this is the simplest thing in the world. And if you're like your, myself and you're not computer survey, um, you're going to find out that it's a little difficult to do. But if someone as ignorant with computers as myself can do it, certainly you can. Uh, very, very interesting. Now, the next question you may be thinking, well, gee, if I'm bonded and this bond has value to it, can I retrieve any of that value? Very interesting. I'm going to be doing some research on that. Um, I have heard of hearsay of some folks that have done that, um, and they are supposedly actually writing debits off of that bond, off of that funding. Um, but I'm not uh, sure of it enough to warrant uh, going over a, a program with you about that. Um, but in the very near future, I'm going to be doing some research on that to see if that is at all true. So, folks, your birth certificate, you've got to understand, goes to the Department of Commerce. What is the task of the Department of Commerce? Financial transactions. Your record of birth goes to the Health Department. That's the flesh and blood you. The birth certificate creates the norm de guerre that the insolvent commercial for-profit entity known as the United States government and the Federal Reserve and everybody else contracts with you. That's how they're doing it. This is how they made you liable for the debt. And this whole dog and pony show about raising the debt ceiling, folks, whether the United States government stays afloat or not has nothing to do with the dog and pony show of the United States government. If the creditors, the Federal Reserve, decide to continue to issue credit to the insolvent corporation, then the insolvent corporation will stay afloat. If the, when the time comes, and it shall, that the, in, the creditors no longer w wish or desire, for whatever reasoning and means, not to issue credit to the insolvent corporation, then the United States government will fall. It has nothing to do with the dog and pony show that you see as, like, say, President Obama. Folks, all we do is elect officials, a president, to an insolvent corporation that's answering to the creditors, but they make you think you have choice. There's no choice. Even the Federal Reserve Chairman, Ben Bernanke, who is the chairman now, the president, well, you say, oh, the president chooses that. Right, the president does choose that from a list of five names given to him by the Federal Reserve Banking System. Don't believe me, look it up. There is no choice. None at all. The only choice that you have is to do your research. Find out that what I'm telling you here is true. 
understand the reasonings why. I mean, look at your children. When you look at your children, understand, Mom, that you have bonded them. They are debtors in a commercial venue of law. They are debtors to a group of international bankers that over 2,000 years ago, even Jesus got mad and threw them out of the temple and called them what? Money changers, money manipulators. Folks, this battle has been going on forever. As Ben Franklin said, the primary cause of, of the, the people to revolt against England was that the king would not allow the colonists to have control of their own currency and issue their own currency without having to pay an interest to the Bank of England. So you think King George was making the decisions, do you? Absolutely not. The Rothschild Banking House uh, and, and also uh, Mr. Patterson, who was in charge of the Bank of England at that time, was making all the decisions. The reason why the Louisiana Purchase took place was because Napoleon Bonaparte was so in debt to the international bankers, he had to sell it to pay off the debt. The reason why they put him on the island was because he started creating his own money through, through the hands of, of the French government. The reason why John F. Kennedy was assassinated, and not by Lee Harvey Oswald, was because of Executive Order 11110 and the fact that he started issuing um, interest silver certificates as a medium of exchange. The bankers were being exposed. Folks, think of this. If you had two choices of a medium of exchange, and one of them was based on debt, and the other one was based on a ounce of silver that you could go to the bank and retrieve that ounce of silver, which one do you think the people would flock to? Very simple. They would flock, they would use the one that held intrinsic value. We have no intrinsic value in our money system now. Our money system is based on debt and the surety to that debt is you. You are a surety. Your children are sureties. Your labors are sureties. You do not own anything. But yet, you turn your television on every day, and they, they have this divide paradigm of left and right, conservative and liberal, pro-life, pro-choice. Folks, all that is is to divide you. All of it divides you. And that's what, that's what it was intended to do keep you looking over here and not right here where the root of the problem can be exposed. You've got to get off the couch, folks. There's not a lot of time left. I am a firm believer that if we're going to turn this around, our opportunity is on December 22nd, 2013, which is not too far away, literally 27 months away. That's our opportunity, folks. If we as a people will educate our representatives and or mandate from our supposed representatives that this Federal Reserve Act, which was usurply put in on December 23rd, 1913, which has a 100-year term, if everybody got together and wrote, called, emailed their representatives and said, even your local representatives, Folks, the people in Washington, D.C., you want to know why they're there? Because they play along with the bankers. They're corrupted. The whole system at that level is just laden with corruption. You remember Donald Rumsfeld, September 10, 2011? Oh, we can't account where $2.3 trillion is. Think of that. But if you don't cross your T's and dot your I's, what happens to you? Can you imagine telling the federal government, I don't know what happened to $2.3 trillion. Don't worry about it. Of course, they told it on September 10th, 2011. Why? Because they knew the very next day that their inside job of 9-11 was going to take place and the people would forget about it. Gee, if you can't account for $2.3 trillion, how many operatives do you think $2.3 trillion will buy? Folks, you've got to understand, and, and please, go to the Office of Vital Statistics. Understand that you're bonded. Understand that if they're born in Vermont, North American bank, no company. 
understand that there's something you can do about it because what takes place is when you turn 18 and you are old enough to negotiate contract, this becomes an implied contract because you did not create a stopple. Well, you've been living under these terms for 18 years. You did not alter or sever your relationship with this contract when you were old enough to do so. So it becomes an implied contract. It implies that you agree to the terms. You don't have to resign anything. We're just going to continue it for you. Get on the internet and do, do the, the mechanics that I just described to you twice. Look up your bond. Understand that your labors are being traded every day. Every single day. Understand that what you have in your pocket for a medium of exchange is an instrument of debt. And that you are the surety for that debt. Understand you're in a commercial law system as a debtor and you are a tenant, tenants in common, or a joint tenant. You do not own anything. Understand that. This is how we're being bled. And the bankers, now they're after the pensions, as we've discussed in other programs. The last piece of the big pie out there, folks, besides having our military go, go do all their privateering and conquering for them, they, and, and they profit on the war. We bleed, they profit. What happened to this whole thing about, well, of course, there was no weapons of mass destruction and blah, blah, and all that, but what happened about using the Iraqi oil revenues to pay for the, the burdens of war? That never happened. Never happened. Why is that? You were lied to again. You were lied to again, over and over and over and again. But still you turn on your TV and you think you're getting truth. Folks, all you're getting is management. They're taking you down the road they want you to take. It may be on the road to the, on the right side of the road. It may be on the left side of the road. But both entities and parties are taking you right down the very same road to being a slave. Do you remember we looked up the definition of slave? And slave is a person who does not live by his own dictates or will, but the will or dictates of another. And you think you're free? You're taxed for everything. You need permission from them, and you have to pay them for the permission. You want to build a house, go to get a permit. You want a job? You better fill out these papers. Hell, we even bond our children in ignorance. They, folks, they laugh at us every day. You got excited about the football game yesterday? Well, that was great. Wasn't that so meaningful in life? You excited about Michael Jackson's trial? Isn't that just so important to the future of your children? No, but they keep feeding you this garbage. And you keep chewing on it, you keep swallowing it, and you keep showing up to the very same table that's providing this garbage for you. You have bonded your children's future. They struggle, they strive, and they base their life on an instrument of debt while the international bankers profit through the mechanisms of war while your sons and daughters are bleeding for their profits. As always, folks, we are very, very thankful that you take time from your busy day to watch this program. We know, because I'm in the same wheel, that we are the proverbial rat in that wheel, and it's just spinning round and round and round. The only way to get out of that wheel, folks, is through knowledge. And the only way for you to gain knowledge is to open up the books, take out the documents that you have. You have all these documents. Read them. Understand the language of them. Go out and buy yourself a Black's Law Dictionary 4th edition. Look up what a driver is. You'll be shocked. You know what a driver is in law, folks? It is a person engaged in commercial law on the roads for, for profit. Licenses were first were only for truck drivers, taxi cab drivers, and chauffeurs. All that represents what? Commerce commercial law. Folks, again, as always, we're very thankful you take the time from your day. We hope you enjoyed the program. We hope you take the time to go ahead and look up your bond. 
your publicly exchanged bond that represents your labors of your life. So the international bankers and the insolvent corporation you know is the United States government can continue to deceive you and make profits from your livelihood. As always, we close reminding you that your government is your responsibility. Thank you for watching. Got to read, read between the lines.